Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the California Armenian Home. On this Palm Sunday, we're here to celebrate the life of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. This is Holy Week now we're into. We're going to uh, read the story in the Bible about how Jesus came to Jerusalem and the people cut branches from palm trees and put them in front of Jesus to walk on because they loved him so much. And let us open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us here together to worship you. We give you the praise and the glory, Jesus, for being our King. Thank you for loving us. We pray now for the California Armenian Home and all the people who live here. Bless them and the staff. Help them to be good examples to the residents and to their families of what a true Christian is. We pray now that you open our hearts and minds so we can hear your word and learn from the scriptures what the Holy Spirit has prepared for us today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so now, before we get into the scriptures about Palm Sunday, let us read uh, and study a little bit about our lives, our daily lives, and how we can benefit from um, building a strong marriage and what it means to have a strong marriage. In this lifetime, we all are going to face challenges and storms. It's part of your journey of life. You're going to have ups and downs. And Jesus acknowledged this reality when he was talking with his disciples before the crucifixion. Before they uh, crucified Jesus, nailed him to a tree, he told this to his disciples. He clarified for them. He said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's John chapter 16, verse 33. So everybody must recognize this truth. We have to know that we're going to have troubles in this world, Jesus told us. So behind, be, there's going to be storms in your life. All different kinds of issues are going to come up during your lifetime. And if you're married, you know that there's going to be additional challenges that come your way. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28, Those who marry will face many troubles in this life. So if you're married, you're going to have extra problems. So don't get me wrong. I believe that marriage is the greatest gift from God. That's wonderful. It's good to be married. However, there's going to be days, weeks, and even months that are going to be challenges in your life. And you're going to see, you're going to face health issues together. You're going to face moving from one house to the other. My uh, lovely daughter, Hasmik, and her husband, Shavam, are here. And there, Shavam was telling me earlier today, uh, by the way, it's Shavam's birthday. We should say, happy birthday, Shavam. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Shavam. <laughs> So Shavam is studying to be a medical doctor, and he was telling me they're planning to move. So see, when you're married, there's going to be times you have to move, you have to pack everything up. And so there's going to be conflicts in your marriage. There's going to be stress from school, graduate school, medical school. And the list goes on and on of all the problems married couples face. So what about you? Have these storms occurred in your life, in your marriage? Have you struggled with marital disagreements, health issues, or different types of pain in your marriage? There could be work-related issues that come up. Um, rebellious children, or even natural disasters. So you're going to have to deal with your aging parents when they get older. All these challenges are going to come between now and the time you go to heaven to be with Jesus on this earth. You're going to have to face these challenges. And there, these, all these problems have, an, have a, an impact on your marriage relationship. So you have to choose what you're going to do when the problems come. 
There's going to be storms in your life. And if we're going to uh, worship Jesus, we have to make it so these storms lead us to greater intimacy with our spouse instead of causing strife in the marriage. So as human beings, we don't have to go too far to see that there's difficult seasons in life. You can see in your parents' lives and people you know, your friends and family. And somehow these difficulties come to all of us. However, as a believer in Jesus, we have to recognize that your enemy is Satan. It isn't your spouse. The devil is the one who's trying to hurt you and destroy you in all these problems that come up. And so we have to know who the enemy is and make calculated plans to counter his attacks in our family. You have to counter the enemy. You have to counter attack. And you know your sword, your weapon is the Bible. So if you know the Bible, you can plan logistics. You can execute a good plan to attack the devil before he uh, destroys your life. Because Jesus said, I came to give you life and life abundantly. So when you cling to Jesus, you will have life. You will have joy of the Lord. Even in difficult situations, the peace of God is always there if you love him. Yes, the enemy is seeking to destroy us. He doesn't like you, the devil. He's very evil. But the good news is that God has given you a chance to lean on him. And with God, with Jesus as your strength, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. With Jesus as your rock, your foundation, you can overcome these issues, these problems in your life. So when you see the storms coming and you recognize that the source of your stress is the devil, Satan is the one, you can face the challenge and defeat him better because in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 to 12 it reminds us, it says, two are better than one. That's talking about a husband and wife. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Praise the holy name of Jesus. You know who the third one is? Jesus. He's with you and your spouse if you love him. So how do you face the storms? How do you face the problems that's going to come in your way, that are coming your way? We already know they're going to happen. What you do is you read the Bible now, pray, increase your faith, and go to church together as a couple so that you will be ready when the storms come. Increase your faith. So you can deal with the devil when he comes to impact your life. Be encouraged in Christ. So how do you stay united? When the challenges are from this world to separate people. So regardless of where you are in your marriage. Or whatever issues come your way. First you should acknowledge that life has challenges. You're going to face challenges. So because you're going to face challenges. You're going to have emotional grief and sadness. That's going to happen. But because you're married, you have each other to build each other up. And as a Christian couple, we're called to walk with Christ, with joy of the Lord, with the peace of God in our hearts. Have forgiveness through the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive one another. James chapter 1 verse 2 says... Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it as joy. 
Recognize the enemy. So when we hit a crisis, couples all oftentimes start to blame each other. Oh, you did this, you did that, you caused the problem, you caused this issue to happen. But the truth is, as I said, the enemy is Satan. And he wants to divide you. Because he hates marriage and he hates the family. He doesn't want you to have children. Like God told Adam and Eve in Genesis, go forth and multiply. That's against the devil's plan. He wants to kill you. He doesn't want you to have children. So all those people who love abortion and they want to kill babies, they're working for Satan. They're anti-Christ. They're anti-Christian. The people who like to kill children. And this week, as you know, there was a, a war in Syria. President Trump sent uh, 60 big weapons, bombs, and he destroyed some of the Syrian army base, the troops, and so forth, where Russia happens to be also. So be ready. World War III may be right around the corner. As soon as Trump kills some Russian troops, you can expect the Russians are going to retaliate. They're not going to sit uh, happily and say nothing. So be prepared. The enemy, Satan, is seeking to kill life. Just like they kill people in America today, unborn babies, thousands of them are killed every day. And so because some terrorist group in Syria killed 80 people with sarin gas in one day, President Trump decided to end the whole war, world by having World War III, a nuclear global war. He's going to do it, it looks like. Pray for peace, brothers and sisters. Ask God to establish peace in this uh, war between Russia and America. We don't want to see war. Because it will be the end. Armageddon. Uh, however, whatever it says in the Bible is going to come true. Jesus is going to return. There is going to be a lot of people killed. And then God will establish peace on earth for a thousand years. It says in Revelation. So that's going to happen. But in the meantime, only the true enemies of Jesus love to kill Christians. Anybody who enjoys killing Christians is working for Satan. It doesn't matter who it is. Everybody who wants to kill Christians is an enemy of Jesus. So in Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Amen. Praise Jesus. He will be with you as long as you pray and you have your faith in, the, in Jesus Christ. So no matter what happens... In the next few weeks or months, when the end comes, be ready. Have the faith of Jesus in your heart. So even if they, you know, decide to end the world, you'll be with God. You won't be in hell burning with the, the devil and his angels. So keep your heart open and don't lose hope. Always be positive. Your hope is in Christ. This world is going to pass. It's going to end. It's all going to burn. But our hope is in Jesus in heaven. Praise God. So are you going to walk through the storms of life bitter and angry? Or are you going to walk with an open heart full of the love of Christ? No matter what the situation is. So if you have a heart that is closed, you, you may have a hardening heart that closes off God. And then you'll be having a black heart instead of a heart of joy. And then what will happen, you'll start acting in ways that are counter-Christian, that are according to the world. Horrible decisions you might make if you have a closed heart to God. Matthew chapter 19, verse 8 says, He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, this is Jesus talking, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So it's the hardness of the heart that causes a lot of problems. So it's essential that you realize and recognize that the well-being of your heart 
is your personal responsibility, not your spouse's or anyone else, the pastor of the church or your family. It's your responsibility to have an open heart, a heart that loves God. It's your responsibility. Don't expect your spouse to do the job for you that he was not or she was not created to do. You can maintain a heart that is alive and full and filled with the joy of Christ that will lead you to forgive and have peace and restoration in your home if you lean on the cross. Surround yourself with faithful Christians and seek help from your Christian brothers and sisters when you need it. Don't be afraid to ask for help. So we know that for a healthy marriage you have to be involved in the church. You have to be part of an active Bible study, learning the Word of God together. That's what it takes to have a healthy marriage. Praying together, learning together, studying the Word together. First, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, we read, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Praise God. Praise Jesus. We have to encourage one another. Don't hesitate, my friends, to get help when you need help. Don't let the storms of this life wash your marriage away. Yes, the storms are coming. Jesus said, the house that is built on sand will be washed away. The house that is built on Jesus Christ, the solid rock, it will not wash away. It will be standing firm even after the storms pass. So yes, the storms will come, but you will survive because you lean on Jesus Christ. <coughs> Ask yourself, how strong is your marriage? And learn to pray together so that you can lean on Christ, the solid rock. Now let us turn our attention to Matthew chapter 21. And as we read Matthew chapter 21, I want you to take inventory of your life. Is Jesus the king of your possessions? Is he? Is Jesus the king of your life? Is Jesus the king of your worship? Do you worship Jesus or do you worship money? Do you follow Jesus or do you follow the crowd, the world? Who do you follow? How far will you go for Jesus? In Matthew chapter 21 we read, As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethanish on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately send them. This was done to fulfill the prophecy. Tell the people of Israel, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. So Matthew mentions a donkey and a colt, and in the other Gospels, they mention just the colt only. So it's the same event in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what it's talking about is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, about a donkey and a colt that are mentioned. So Jesus' actions show that he fulfilled the prophet's words. And this indicates that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, he confirmed his messianic royalty as well as his humility. Jesus is a humble king. He loves the humble, not the proud. The two disciples did as Jesus said. They brought the animals to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd 
spread their coats on the road ahead of Jesus, and others cut branches from the palm trees and spread them on the road. He was in the center of the procession, and the crowds all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was stirred as he entered. Who is this, they asked, and the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So we see in verse 8 that the crowds spread palm branches on the road of them. It talks about Jesus boldly. He was declared the king, and the crowd rejoiced that Jesus the king was coming to Jerusalem. And you know what happened? A week later, these same people bowed down to political pressure and deserted him, and they called for his execution. So you see, politicians are very wicked. They can turn your mind from good to evil. You can't trust them. So today we celebrate this event on Palm Sunday. And this day you should remember to guard yourself against superficial claims against Christ. There's many people who are against Jesus. And they'll try to turn your mind against God. And here we see in chapter uh, 21 verse 12. Jesus entered a temple and began to drive out the merchants and their customers. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the stalls of those selling doves. He said, The scripture declares my temple will be called a place of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So this is all happening when Jesus enters Jerusalem as the king, and he's not just saying, it's okay, you can come to church and, you know, be thieves, steal the money. No, that's God's house. He cleared it out. He made a rope, a whip from some rope, and he whipped them. And he turned over their tables and he said, get out. He drove them away. He was angry with them. So this is the second time Jesus cleared the temple. In John chapter 2, verse 13, we see he did it there also. The merchants and money changers set up their booths in the court of the Gentiles in the temple, crowding out the Gentiles who had come from all over the world to worship God. The merchants sold sacrificial animals at high prices, taking advantage of those who had come from long distance cities from far away. And the money changers exchanged all the international currency for the special temple coins, the only money the merchants would accept. They often deceived foreigners who didn't know the exchange rate. So you see, bankers are criminals. They're evil, wicked people. They steal money from people. That's what Jesus said. Their commercialization in God's house frustrated people's attempts to worship God. And this greatly angered Jesus. Any, any activity that interferes with worshiping God should be stopped especially at church, according to Jesus. Jesus, by the way, celebrated the Passover. The Passover and Palm Sunday are closely related. And let's look in the Bible at Psalms chapter 118, to see what it says. <coughs> Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let the congregation of Israel repeat. His faithful love endures forever. That's the first two verses. Then we're going to look at verse 19 to 29. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter. And I will go in and thank the Lord. Those gates lead to the presence of the Lord. And the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and saving me. The stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, 
Please save us. Please, Lord, please give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God shining upon us. Bring forward the sacrifice and put it on the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Praise his name. Praise the holy name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. It's talking about Jesus here in Psalms. And we see that what happened? Why was the Passover important? How did it happen to coincide with Jesus coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? The Passover we read about in Exodus chapter 12. Let's see what happened. Now the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron while they were still in the land of Egypt. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice. If a family is too small to eat an entire lamb, let them share the lamb with another family in the neighborhood. Whether or not they share in this way depends on the size of each family and how much they can eat. Boy, my family, we had five kids. You could eat two lambs. This animal must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no physical defects. Take special care of these lambs until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. It gives you specific instructions here in Exodus. Then each family in the community must slaughter its lamb. They are to take some of the lamb's blood and smear it on the top and sides of the door frame of the house where the lamb will be eaten. And do you know why they did that? They still do that. The Jewish people still do this today. They still do it every year at Passover. Because when they were going to leave Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt, and the Pharaoh said, no, you can't go. We're going to keep you. Moses said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no. God sent plague after plague after plague until finally the last plague was that the firstborn child of every uh, Egyptian family was going to be slaughtered by the angel of death, the, the angel from heaven. And God told the Hebrews this instruction, put the blood of a lamb on your door and when the angel comes he'll see the blood and he won't kill the firstborn in that house. But every house that doesn't have the blood of the lamb, their first child, their first son will be killed. Their firstborn son. And so, that happened, and Pharaoh said, you can go. Leave. I don't want you anymore in, my, in Egypt. You can go. He let the people go because that was too much pain for the Egyptian king. And so, now, every year since then, for thousands of years, the Jewish people still slaughter a lamb at Passover and they remember by sparing the blood on their door that the angel passed over their house. He didn't kill their firstborn. And now we know that Jesus, when he came to Jerusalem as the king on Palm Sunday, they, they killed him and his blood was spilt on the cross this, the week after. So he became our lamb. Jesus is your Passover lamb. You don't have to kill a lamb anymore. You don't have to put the blood on your door. Because you're a Christian. You follow Christ. You're a follower of Jesus. And His blood protects you. The blood of Jesus Christ covers you. And keeps you from the enemy, from Satan. Verse 8. That evening, everyone must eat roast lamb with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Well, sounds like a good idea to me. I love roast lamb. The meat must never be eaten raw or boiled. Roast it all, including the head, legs, and internal organs. We're talking about the liver, the kidneys, you know, the heart. Don't boil it. The Bible says roast it. Shish kebab. 
Do not leave any of it until the next day. Whatever is not eaten that night must be burned before morning. Wear your traveling clothes as you eat this meal, as though prepared for a long journey. Wear your sandals. Carry your walking stick in your hands. Eat the food quickly, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and kill all the firstborn sons and firstborn male animals in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. The blood you have smeared on your doorposts will serve as a sign. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. You must remember this day forever. Each year you will celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. For seven days you may eat only bread made without yeast. On the very first day you must remove every trace of yeast from your home. Anyone who eats bread made with yeast at any time during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. On the first day of the festival and again on the seventh day, all the people must gather for a time of special worship. No work of any kind may be done on these days except the preparation of food. Celebrate this festival of, of unleavened bread for it will remind you that I brought you out of the land of Egypt on this very day. This festival will be a permanent regulation for you to be kept from generation to generation. Only bread without yeast may be eaten from the evening of the 14th day of the month until the evening of the 21st day of the month. During those seven days, there must be no trace of yeast in your home. Anyone who eats anything made with yeast during this week will be cut off from the community of Israel. It's repeating it twice so you don't forget. It's important when the Bible repeats something twice. These same regulations apply to the foreigners living with you, as if they had been born among you. I repeat, during those days you must not eat anything made with yeast. Wherever you live, eat only bread that has no yeast in it. Do you know why yeast is important? Because, you know why they couldn't eat yeast? Bread made with yeast? Because when you make bread, I've made bread lots of times with yeast, you have to wait. You put the yeast in the flour with the sugar and the water and the salt. You mix it all up. Then you wait six or seven hours for it to rise. Then what do you do? You punch it down. You knead it some more. Then you wait another six or seven hours for it to rise a second time. Do you think these people had time to wait while they're planning to leave Egypt in a hurry? No, that's why it says, be prepared, have your walking stick with you, your sandals, your clothes for a long journey. That's why they made bread with no yeast, so they didn't have to wait even one minute. They mixed the flour with the water and the salt, and they baked it and ate it right away. They couldn't wait 12 hours for the yeast to rise and then bake the bread. They didn't have time. So now every year, they eat bread without yeast to remember that day when they were freed from Egypt, from slavery. Then Moses called for the leaders of Israel and said, Tell each of your families to slaughter the lamb they have set apart for a Passover. Drain each lamb's blood into a basin. Then take a cluster of hyssop branches and dip it into the lamb's blood. Strike the hyssop against the top and sides of the doorframe, staining it with the blood. And remember, no one is allowed to leave the house until morning, for the Lord will pass through the land and strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit the destroyer to enter and strike down your firstborn. Remember these instructions. They are permanent and must be observed by you and your descendants forever. When you arrive in the land the Lord has promised to give you, you will continue to celebrate this festival. Then your children will ask, What does all this mean? What is this ceremony about? And you will reply, It is the celebration of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the homes of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he killed the Egyptians, he spared our families and did not destroy us. 
Then all the people bowed their heads and worshipped. By the way, as we're reading this, do you know there was some Jewish people, Hebrew people in Egypt, they, they weren't faithful? They didn't put the blood, they didn't kill a lamb. And what happened? Their firstborn was killed because they didn't ob observe, they didn't obey God. They were very sorry that they didn't have faith in God, that they didn't follow the instructions of God. Do you obey God? Do you obey Jesus' commands that are written in the Bible? So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. And at midnight the Lord killed all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn son of the captive in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night. And loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. So we see that you can't play with God. God is holy. He is just. He demands that we be holy. That we be pure. That we remove sin from our lives. He loves you. But he wants you to obey him. It's not a joke. It's not optional. If you want to, you can obey God. If you don't want to, well, it's okay. Don't obey him. No. He said, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. What does that mean? If you don't obey him, you don't love him. Those who love Jesus obey his commands. So, the Jewish people were celebrating their freedom from bondage. That's what we just read. Jesus celebrated the Passover. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He gave them communion. Communion with who? With God. He said, drink this wine. It's my blood. Drink this bread. It's my flesh. Remember me. He's our God. He's our King. We have to remember Jesus and obey him. Because he loves us and we love him. We can't do anything on our own. We can't achieve any goals by ourselves, by doing what we think is right. What you think is right is not right. What the Bible says is right, that is right. I myself, I don't know anything except what the Bible says is true. I believe the Bible. I don't believe what people say. Everybody can say, oh, no, no, that's good. That, it doesn't matter what they say. It matters to me what the Bible says. And it should be the same for you, for your life, so you can enjoy eternal life in heaven with Jesus, worshiping him with the angels, singing songs of glory, praising his holy name, eating at the banquet. There's going to be a big feast in heaven of joy for those who love Jesus. Of course, his enemies are going to be in a hot place. They're not going to enjoy the feast. They're not going to enjoy the rivers, the river of life that's flowing through heaven with the fruit trees that give you life. They're not going to enjoy that. You know why? Because they chose to reject Jesus. They chose not to come to worship service. They chose the pleasures of this earth instead of obeying God. So what we can do, we can worship Jesus with our hearts, build up our marriages according to the scriptures and observe what, the, what God expects from us and obey him, do what he says and share his love with others. He loves you. That's why he died for you. That's why he shed his blood for you. So who do you follow? How long are you going to go with him? Are you going to obey everything Jesus says or just a few things to make it look like you're a Christian? Don't be confused. Many people who come to church, they're not going to be in heaven. Because they just come to church to look good. See, we go to church. We're good people. But they don't obey. So they're not going to heaven. Only the ones who obey Jesus are. 
If you haven't obeyed him until now, pray in your heart for forgiveness, for God to forgive you. He will. Ask him, please forgive me for being disobedient, for not obeying your commands. I love you, Lord. Change my heart. Increase my faith. Make me a true follower of Christ. I'm humbly asking you, Lord, to strengthen my faith because I love you and I want to be in heaven with you for all eternity to worship you. Bow down before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the Bible it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's better if you do it now than you wait for the judgment day because then it'll be too late. Praise God, let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for coming to earth for this wonderful Palm Sunday celebration that we enjoy, that we're happy that you came into Jerusalem as the king riding on the donkey, that you went into the temple and you drove out the wicked bankers, the money changers, who were charging too much interest and ripping people off. Thank you for being a just king, a humble king. And we pray that you will give us humble hearts, increase our faith, forgive our sins, Help us to forgive those who trespass against us. Bless the California Armenian home and the residents here. I ask you, Jesus, to make them all warriors for Christ. So through their humble act actions, people will see that you live in them. And they will be good examples to their families and to the other residents here. So that we can win souls for Christ. That we can stand before you on Judgment Day and say, yes, Lord, we fulfilled your commandments. We obeyed what you said. We fed the hungry. We gave clothes to the naked. We did what you asked us to do. We love you, Lord. I pray now that you be with us. Give us the peace of the Lord as we go forward from here. Strengthen our families. In Jesus' name, amen.